I have transmigrated into the world of a novel, and it's a tragic love story, as the three main laws of novel transmigration say. Female empowerment stories turn male supporting characters into sweethearts. In the story of betrayal, you become the male lead. In tragic love stories, you're the unfortunate soul. Exactly. The original owner's wife faked her death. She left him with an old woman and a young child. Plus a mountain of debt. The original owner was kind and virtuous. He shouldered everything alone. Raised his son. Cared for his mother-in-law. In the end, due to overwork, his heart failed. His ungrateful son pulled out his oxygen tube causing a miserable death. However, I am not the original owner. Fake death, is it? I immediately dialed the crematorium. My mother-in-law woke from her coma. She asked if I had sent her daughter back home for burial. I patted the urn in my hand and said, Mom, no need for all that trouble. The crematorium had a discount. I've already cremated her. Chapter 1. At the funeral home, Alicia lay there quietly. She was covered with a white cloth. Only her pale face exposed. Lifeless. I stood aside. Watching my mother-in-law Sandra and son Simon wailing over her, I felt speechless. My daughter, how could you be so heartless to leave me, an old woman, to bury her child? How am I supposed to live without you? Sandra cried out, but no tears came. Mom, get up. You haven't bought me the limited edition Ultraman yet. Five-year-old Simon wailed, his tiny fists pounding on Alicia's chest. I lowered my eyes to hide the mockery within. I reached out to hold Alicia's cold hand. Wife, why are you so foolish? I choked up. Warm tears dripping onto her cold hand. The tears were real, but inside I felt nothing, even had the urge to laugh. I gently rubbed Alicia's wrist. I appeared sad, but I was actually checking her pulse. Nothing. Not a single beat. I moved my fingers under her nose. No breath. I was secretly amazed. This Alicia is quite the actress. I don't know where she got the drug, but she seems exactly like a dead person. I withdrew my hand calmly, recalling the melodramatic plot of this tragic love story. The original character, Romeo. Lost his parents early, they left him a company and a large inheritance. Later, Alicia conspired with her first love, who was my assistant in the company, to embezzle the remaining funds. Then she faked suicide, leaving behind an old woman and a child, plus a pile of debt for the original owner. He was sincere and kind, shouldered everything alone, and painstakingly raised the unruly son until he got into college. He also cared for his mother-in-law who had a stroke. No matter how they bullied and exploited him, he always accepted it willingly. In the end, the son he worked so hard to raise turned out to be Alicia and her first love's child. With astonishing willpower, the original owner not only paid off the debts but also expanded the company. However, years of toil took a toll. He developed severe heart failure. While he struggled on his hospital bed, the ungrateful son pulled out his oxygen tube to seize his assets. His wife, who had returned from the dead, stood coldly by with her first love and the miraculously recovered mother-in-law. Watching it all, they said a sentence that made him die with regret. Have a safe journey. Thinking of this, my blood boiled. Bastards, are you ready to face my retaliation? Chapter 2 Mom, stop crying. Your eyes aren't good to begin with. If you cry yourself blind, we'll have to go to the hospital again. I gently patted Sandra's shoulder. My tone was soft but carried a hidden sharpness. Sandra suddenly looked up, pointing at my nose, spitting as she yelled. How can I not cry? You jinx. You cursed your own parents to death. And now my precious daughter. How am I supposed to live? Her wrinkled face was full of resentment, as if she wanted to tear me apart. In the original story, Romeo took all the blame because of such words. He endured Sandra's accusations for twenty years, ultimately meeting a tragic end. Simon quickly hid behind Sandra, peeking at me warily. Dad, don't jinx me, I'm still young. I clutched my chest, pretending to be heartbroken. Mom, Simon, since you're afraid I'll jinx you, I'll leave now and stay far away from you. Sandra was stunned, not expecting me to react this way. Immediately. She collapsed onto the ground, wailing loudly. Her sharp cries echoed throughout the funeral hall, drawing the staff's attention. My daughter, look at the men you married. You're still lying here, and he wants to abandon us. We'd be better off dead. Simon grabbed onto me. Humph, I won't let you go. Who will be my servant? Who will let me ride on them? I was overjoyed. I squatted down and hugged the little chubby boy. Simon, aren't you afraid that dad will jinx you? I, I, Simon stammered, caught in a fierce internal struggle. I looked into his eyes seriously. Simon, even without me as your horse, you still have your old horse grandma. But nothing is more important than being alive. Understand. He glanced at Sandra with a hint of disdain, then nodded. Seeing that I was willing to abandon my son, Sandra panicked. She quickly got up, her expression changing instantly. Romeo, I was just too upset earlier. Don't take it to heart. Just then, a group of fierce-looking men approached. The tattooed leader was chewing betel nut. He glanced at Alicia lying there 
pulled out a half-meter-long steel rod from behind, measured it against her right leg, then swung down heavily. Crack! I heard the sound of bones breaking. Yet Alicia remained motionless. Sandra screamed and rushed over. Ah, my daughter's leg. It might be broken. Well, she's really dead. The tattooed man remarked. He weighed the steel rod in his hand, then looked at us. You're Alicia's family. She owes money, so you'll have to pay up. Hearing they were debt collectors, Sandra cried even harder. She rolled her eyes and fainted on the spot. Mom, what's wrong? Don't scare me. I shouted in panic, pressing hard on Sandra's philtrum with my thumb. Her body twitched slightly, but her eyes remained closed. Hey, quite the actress. I pressed even harder. This old woman, I pressed her philtrum until it bled, but she still wouldn't wake up. After ten minutes, one of the debt collectors with a scar couldn't stand it anymore. Hey, maybe you should call 911. Oh right. Silly me. Thanks for the reminder. An ambulance arrived swiftly, and Sandra was carried onto a stretcher. I narrowed my eyes, noticing a tear slipping from the corner of her eye. The clenched fists hidden in her sleeves finally relaxed. Filial piety is important. As her son-in-law, I naturally accompanied her in the ambulance. Old hag, trying to dump this mess on me. Not a chance. Chapter 3. After seeing off the elderly one, I took the young one to kindergarten. Then I returned to the funeral home and called the crematorium. By paying double. I jumped the queue. Soon, Alicia was dragged into the crematorium. Family member, please present the death certificate. The staff's voice carried a professional detachment. To complete the act thoroughly, Sandra and Alicia had already prepared the death certificates. Now, it greatly aided me. I took it directly out of my bag and handed it to the staff. After confirming everything was in order, he pressed the conveyor belt button. I watched coldly as Alicia was pushed into the cremation furnace. Instantly swallowed by the tongues of fire, I softly said, have a safe journey. Two hours later, the staff came out holding a small urn. Sir, please accept our condolences. The moment I received the urn, my heart couldn't help but tremble. I actually saw Alicia. No, to be precise, I saw her ghost. Her charred soul emitted a semi-transparent mist, and her previously broken right leg dangled in the air. You bastard. Why did you cremate me? She glared at me with wide eyes. Now I'm really dead because of you. Do you know that? Encountering a bizarre event like transmigrating into a novel. Seeing ghosts wasn't surprising. I pretended not to see her, calmly thanked the staff, and turned to leave. Romeo, stop right there. She angrily floated over, trying to grab my throat, but her hands could only pass through my body, causing no harm. I was even surprised to find that wherever the ashes were, her soul was there. This made things even more interesting. I curled my lips, holding her urn, and took a taxi to the hospital. Sandra, lying in the hospital bed, had already woken up. She was struggling to sit up but couldn't move. I quickly put down the urn and stepped forward to help her. Mom, you're awake. How do you feel? The doctor said you had a minor stroke due to excessive grief and need to rest. Sandra grabbed my hand, her clouded eyes full of anxiety. Son-in-law, have the relatives from our hometown arrived? Has Alicia's body been taken back? Sandra had told me before that in their hometown, they preferred burials, believing that people should return to their roots after death to rest in peace. In the original story, the protagonist was entangled by debt collectors and couldn't handle everything. Relatives from back home came and took Alicia away without a word, thus beginning his tragic journey. Mom, there's no need for such trouble. I picked up the urn beside me and patted it. The crematorium had a discount. I've already cremated her. There was a moment of silence in the ward. Sandra stared at me in disbelief. What? What did you say? I said. Alicia, your precious daughter, has been cremated and turned into ashes. I enunciated each word clearly. Sandra could no longer keep up the pretense. Like a cat whose tail had been stepped on, she jumped up, her cheeks trembling with anger. You despicable man. Didn't I say to send her back home for burial? Did you take my words as a joke? Why did you cremate her? Why? Give me back my daughter. Give me back my daughter. As she cursed, her cries turned into a heart-wrenching howl. Ah, I will kill you. Kill you, you scoundrel. Alicia pounced over, trying to scratch me but to no avail. I patiently comforted her. Mom. Whether it's cremation or burial, it's all the same. When people die, like a lamp going out, nothing matters anymore. Sandra glared at me viciously. Is it the same? Is it the same? Why wouldn't it be the same? Unless, I paused slightly, covering my mouth in surprise. Unless Alicia isn't dead. Sandra's pupils trembled violently. Alicia's hands froze in midair. I lowered my eyelids and sighed. Alas, how could she be alive? After all, I used the death certificate you provided to cremate her. Otherwise they wouldn't have done it. You, you, you. Sandra pointed at me, stammering for a long time. Her eyes rolled back, and she fell straight down, 
Alicia instinctively floated over to catch her but could only watch. Helplessly as her mother's body passed through her hands and fell heavily to the ground. Mom, doctor, please save my mom. I coldly smirked. You care so much about your mom, but you treat your husband like nothing. Chapter 4. Sandra truly had a stroke this time. The doctor looked grave as he told me. Mr. Romeo, your mother-in-law must be hospitalized for treatment, and the costs are not low. Your family needs to be prepared. I looked at the medical bill in my hand and said with a heavy expression. Doctor, our family is bankrupt. My wife just passed away, and there's a pile of debts. I really have no money for treatment. The doctor sighed, looking at me with sympathy in his eyes. Alicia circled around me anxiously. Romeo, I'm telling you, my mom must be treated. She has a lot of private money hidden under her mattress. Hurry home and get it. Do you hear me? Oh, so the old woman has private money. You're really something. Well, that money is mine now. I rubbed my temples, making a show of determination. Doctor, no matter what. My mother-in-law's illness must be treated. Alicia breathed a sigh of relief. At least you have some conscience. I continued. Please prescribe some affordable medication. We'll take her home and treat her ourselves. No, you can't take her home. Alicia floated beside me, trembling with anger. If anything happens to my mom, I won't let you off even as a ghost. Hey, aren't you already a ghost? Chapter 5. While getting the medication, my phone suddenly rang. I answered the call. It was the kindergarten teacher. Hello. Is this Simon's father? Simon had a conflict with a classmate at school. Could you come over when you have a moment? What kind of conflict? Simon lifted a female classmate's skirt. The girl's parents are very upset and are causing a scene at the kindergarten. Could you? I understand. I'll come over immediately. I couldn't help but sigh. Each of them is more troublesome than the last. After hanging up, I carried the urn and hailed a taxi to the kindergarten. Naturally, Alicia followed, floating alongside me. Before I reached the office, I heard a child crying. The girl's mother was holding her child, comforting her softly. When she saw me, her eyes flared with anger. How do you educate your son, so young, and already behaving improperly? Simon, apologize. I ordered sternly. Simon stood against the wall, not showing a hint of fear. Instead, he spat at me defiantly. I walked over, grabbed the back of Simon's collar with one hand, like picking up a little chick, and brought him before the girl's mother. I'll say it again, apologize. Simon rolled his eyes and muttered. I just lifted her skirt. If I take off my pants for her, wouldn't that make us even? You. The girl's mother glared at both of us, her face turning pale with anger. I'm sorry. I will make sure to give you and your daughter a proper explanation. I glanced around, found a thumb-thick twig by the flower bed, broke it off, grabbed Simon, and with a sharp snap, struck his chubby backside. Simon immediately let out a piercing scream, struggling desperately. What are you doing? How dare you hit me? I'll tell grandma, and she'll make you pay. Your grandma. She can't even take care of herself right now. Still talking back. If I don't straighten you out today, I'm not your dad. Wah. You're a bad man. You're not my dad. Indeed. I'm not your dad. I struck him even harder. Romeo. Stop. Simon lifting her skirt was a compliment to her. You always acted like a gentle and loving father in front of me. Now that I'm gone, you're showing your true colors. In life, Alicia excessively spoiled this son. Whenever the original owner wanted to discipline him. Alicia would act like she'd married the wrong person to manipulate him, accusing him of being abusive. As a result, he rarely laid a hand on the child. But I'm not the original owner. Dealing with a brat like this calls for firm discipline. Ow. It hurts. Dad. Please stop. I won't do it again. Simon was crying loudly, his face smeared with snot and tears. The girl's mother and the teacher, seeing him punished so severely, felt a bit sympathetic and quickly stepped in. That's enough. He's just a child. You might hurt him if you continue. Yes. Simon said he knows he's wrong. I paused and looked coldly at Simon. Let it go. Can we really let today's incident go? If he doesn't understand his mistake now, he'll make bigger mistakes in the future. What then when he grows up? Simon was frightened by my stern gaze, shivering as he sobbed. I'm sorry, Eva. I was wrong. I shouldn't have lifted your skirt. Only then did I nod in satisfaction, tossing the twig aside. Remember today's lesson. If you repeat this behavior, it won't just be a spanking next time. Chapter 6. I brought Simon home and as soon as we entered, I collapsed onto the sofa, although the villa had been seized, it hadn't been auctioned off yet, so we could still live in it for the time being, Simon stood in front of me, hands on his hips, glaring at me angrily, I raised an eyebrow and asked, hungry, Simon nodded, your noble prince wants fried chicken and burgers, I sat up, pinched his chubby cheeks, and said with a smile, the prince sure dreams big, go eat dirt, Simon obviously didn't expect me to talk to him like that. He raised his little fists to hit me but shrank back under my stern gaze. Then he lay on the floor and started throwing a tantrum. 
This made Alicia feel sorry for him again. She pointed at me and scolded. Didn't you hear the child wants fried chicken and burgers? He's growing. What kind of father are you? I couldn't be bothered with this crazy woman. I walked into the bedroom, took out my phone, and ordered three takeout dishes in one go. One spicy crayfish, one spicy grilled fish, and one pickled pepper bullfrog. Note, extra spicy. At least you have some conscience. Alicia's eerie voice echoed in my ear. I smiled and began unpacking the takeout. Alicia floated to the dining table, glanced at the food I'd ordered, and was so angry she was speechless. Don't you know children can't eat spicy food? Are you doing this on purpose? Yes, I am doing it on purpose. What can you do about it? Smelling the aroma, Simon happily ran over. When he realized there was no fried chicken or burgers for him, he started wailing at the top of his lungs. After he cried enough and Alicia finished scolding me, I had also finished eating. Simon, it's not that dad doesn't want to buy you food, but the doctor says you're overweight and need to lose weight. If you're really hungry, there's leftover porridge in the trash from yesterday. You can dig it out and eat it. Hearing this, Simon cried even harder. Still have the energy to cry, looks like you're not that hungry. I stood up, patted Simon's little head, and said, Simon, help dad clean up the trash. I'm going to take a shower. Chapter 7 When I walked out of the bathroom, I was stunned. The study's bookcase doors were wide open, and the books inside had been cut into pieces, scattered on the floor like confetti. The computer on the desk was smashed, the main unit was destroyed, the graphics card removed and crushed into powder. It was a complete mess. What made me even more furious was that there was a puddle of yellow liquid on the bed, along with trash swarming with flies, emitting a nauseating smell, and the culprit, Simon, was standing at the doorway, laughing heartily. Alicia sat on the window sill, clapping her hands in delight. That's my precious boy. Well done. You finally helped your mom vent her anger. Good. Very good. Excellent. I pulled out a hammer from the tool cabinet. The cold metal gleamed under the light, seeing the hammer in my hand. Simon's face turned pale. He turned to run. What are you doing? I warn you. Don't do anything crazy. Alicia's terrified voice rang in my ears. I ignored her, grabbed Simon's arm, and dragged him back. Batman, let me go. Let me go. Simon struggled desperately, but it was useless. I pressed him onto a chair and picked up his Ultraman toy. No, don't smash my Ultraman. Simon shook his head and shouted. I cruelly curled my lips, raised the hammer in my hand, and smashed it down on Ultraman's head. With a crisp bang, Ultraman's head shattered instantly, plastic shards and parts flying everywhere. Ah, wah, you broke my Ultraman, you owe me a new one. Simon's shoulders shook as he wailed loudly. Alicia roared, you bastard, are you crazy? That was Simon's favorite toy. Simon, when you do something wrong, you need to be punished. You just got disciplined at kindergarten, and you've already forgotten. Looks like the lesson wasn't deep enough. I raised the hammer, ready to strike the next target. No, don't smash my toys. Simon, with snot bubbles forming, begged me to stop. I smiled at him, and the hammer in my hand mercilessly came down. Bang, bang, bang. Toy cars, transformers, dinosaur models. One by one, the toys turned into piles of trash under my hammer. Simon's cries grew increasingly desperate, eventually turning into low sobs. I stopped and looked at him coldly. Do you realize your mistake? I know, I was wrong. I won't dare to do it again. Fine, I'll believe you one last time. Alicia clutched her singed hair, fuming to the point of madness because she had run out of curses to hurl at me. Oh well, what can I do? I just enjoy seeing her hate me to the core yet being utterly helpless. Chapter 8 At night, I held Alicia's urn, reminiscing. Alicia, how are you down there? I really miss you. I scolded Simon today and even punished him. You won't blame me, right? I faced the urn, forcing out a few tears. Listen to me, you're such a reasonable person. How could you blame me? You bastard. Not only do I blame you, but I also wish I could tear you to pieces. Alicia's dark face shoved close to mine, her features twisted and ferocious. I remained calm, subtly shifting so she faced the mirror behind me. Ah, ghost. Alicia looked in horror at her reflection in the mirror, letting out a piercing scream. I bit my lower lip, struggling to suppress the urge to burst into laughter. Ha ha. So ghosts can see themselves in mirrors. I placed her urn on the bedside table in the bedroom and closed the door. Alicia loved cleanliness when she was alive but now I've trapped her in this foul-smelling room, unable to take a single step out. I don't even need to imagine how close she is to breaking down. Two days later, I went to the hospital to bring Sandra home. Sandra had partial paralysis, her mouth crooked, eyes slanted, able only to make incoherent sounds. With her having a stroke, I felt the world was finally peaceful. Mom, don't worry, even though we're out of money, I'll take good care of you, I said hypocritically, pushing Sandra into her bedroom. She tilted her mouth 
her trembling hand pointing at her bed. Are you tired and want to sleep? Sandra shook her head anxiously, continuing to point at the bed, making ah sounds from her throat. Are you saying there's something under the bed? Sandra nodded frantically. I stepped forward, lifted the mattress, and found nothing underneath. Sandra's eyes widened, blood vessels visible in her eyeballs. She ah ed twice and fainted. Of course, I knew she was looking for her stash of money, but it had long since found its way into my pocket. These days, I've been diligently playing the role of a good son-in-law. The doctor said she needed a light diet, so I gave Sandra a bowl of plain porridge every day. The doctor said she needed more sunlight, so I pushed her onto the balcony at noon every day to sunbathe for two hours, to help her recover soon. I even learned acupuncture and would poke her from time to time. I'm so filial. Of course, I have to let my dead wife see it with her own eyes. Alicia's urn was placed under Sandra's wheelchair, seeing me bring another bowl of plain porridge. Alicia glared at me angrily, gritting her teeth, porridge again and again. You heartless bastard. You have money to order takeout but won't make something decent for my mom. Heartless. Compared to your mom, I'm far from it. I recalled how the original owner, after Sandra's stroke, took meticulous care of her without a word of complaint. And how did Sandra treat him? She despised him, scolded him, and even deliberately splashed scalding soup on him. The original owner endured it all silently, foolishly believing that if he treated Sandra well, she would forgive him one day. Evil people need to be dealt with by other evil people. As for me, I've never been a kind person. I scooped a spoonful of porridge, brought it to Sandra's mouth, and sighed softly. Mom, we're really out of money. Please make do. When I find a job, I'll improve your meals. Sandra looked at the plain porridge in front of her, then at me, and turned her old face away. Mom, do you want to save this porridge for Simon? You're such a good grandma. I'll thank you on Simon's behalf. With that, ignoring Sandra's incoherent protests, I turned and took the porridge back to the kitchen and poured it into the trash. Chapter 9 On the weekend, I rarely got to sleep in, but the persistent ringing of the doorbell made my temples throb. Who is it? So early in the morning. I impatiently opened the door. Standing outside were several burly men, the same debt collectors from before. Well, you finally decided to open the door. The tattooed leader glared at me fiercely. I pretended to be scared. The house is being auctioned. The money will automatically be transferred to your accounts. Don't give me that. I'm telling you. The money from selling the house only covers the principal. There's still two million in interest. The tattooed man rudely pushed past me, leading his men swaggering into the house. I was shoved aside, stumbling and falling to the ground, clutching my chest as I coughed violently. The tattooed man squatted down, sizing me up. If the money isn't enough, I don't mind having your body parts appear on different people to repay the debt. I'm afraid you'll be disappointed. I coughed, struggling to stand. From the canvas bag hanging in the entryway, I pulled out a crumpled medical report. Trembling as I handed it to the bald man, I cough cough, I have late stage lung cancer, I don't have long to live, but there's an assistant in my company named Diego, I've always suspected he had an inappropriate relationship with my wife, before she committed suicide, there was a large transaction in the company's account, I suspect, hearing this, their eyes lit up, watching them leave, I curled my lips into a smile, chapter 10, I grew tired of tormenting Sandra every day, so I decided to send her back to her hometown to be cared for by her younger sister. Her sister had suffered a lot because of her when they were young. Sandra even broke up her family. You could say she hates Sandra to the core. I called and said I'd give her some money each month. As long as she keeps her sister alive, I believe she'll take better care of her than I can. Since I disciplined Simon last time, he's been much more obedient. Today, he even offered to help me cook. It's like the sun rising in the west, thinking this would be our last meal together. I mercifully made a pot of chicken soup for Sandra. Sandra hadn't touched meat for months and devoured three bowls ravenously. Alicia looked at me and snorted, finally showing some conscience. Sandra was content. Just as she let out a burp, her eyes rolled back, foam bubbled from her mouth, and she collapsed to the ground. Mom! Alicia exclaimed. You bastard! What did you do to my mom? Hearing the commotion, Simon ran over. Dad, what's wrong with grandma? Seeing Sandra lying on the ground, Simon turned pale with fright. I didn't have time to answer him. I immediately picked up the phone and dialed 911. At the hospital, I stood outside the operating room, waiting for the doctor's diagnosis. Simon sat nearby, pinching his fingers. Doctor, how is my mother? Seeing the doctor come out, I quickly approached him. Please accept our condolences. The patient was severely poisoned and has passed away. Poisoned? How could she be poisoned? We detected Ammonita muscaria in the patient's vomit. Ammonita muscaria? If mistakenly ingested, this mushroom can cause vomiting, diarrhea, mental confusion, and in severe cases, death. I suddenly looked at Simon. Simon, was it you? Simon burst into tears. Wah. 
I didn't mean to poison grandma. I just wanted to give you diarrhea. A chill ran through me. Some children are just children. Some are born devils. Simon was taken to the police station. He kept crying, saying he didn't know that eating too much of that mushroom would cause death. The police gave him a stern lecture, but since he was young and it was accidental, they released him after a few days. From my conversation with Simon, Alicia learned that her precious son had killed her own mother. She collapsed to the ground, screaming, her crimson eyes shedding two lines of bloody tears. I glanced coldly at her and began packing Simon's things. Clothes, toys, books, everything was stuffed into a big suitcase. Simon stood at the door, looking at me in confusion, his little face full of unease. Dad, what are you doing? I stopped, tilted my head, and looked directly at him. Actually, you're not my child. I'm sending you to your real dad now. Simon was stunned, his eyes wide, as if he didn't understand what I said. Alicia asked in horror, Romeo, when did you find out Simon isn't your child? What else do you know? Of course, I didn't respond to her. Carrying her urn, I shoved Simon into the car and drove toward the address. Chapter 11. Following the address given by the private investigator, I knocked on the rusty iron door of a rented house. I knocked for a long time before the door finally opened. Seeing her long-lost first love, Alicia's charred face softened. Diego, I've missed you so much, but why are you living in such a rundown place? I rolled my eyes countless times in my heart. It's utterly disgusting. What are you doing here? Diego looked haggard but still spoke fiercely. Did you send those debt collectors? Looking at his downtrodden appearance, it seems those people didn't treat him kindly. I sneered coldly. You and Alicia did bad things behind my back, and now you don't allow me to fight back. You should feel lucky. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you but visiting you in prison. Diego was speechless, his eyes flickering. Tell me, what do you want? I've been raising your son for so many years. Now I'm returning him to his rightful father. I stepped aside, pointing to Simon behind me. Diego's face stiffened upon seeing Simon, his voice trembling. You, what did you say? I said, your son Simon, I'm bringing him back to you, I repeated calmly, what's all the noise about, can't a person sleep? A sharp female voice came from inside the room, a flamboyant woman appeared at the door, sleepy-eyed and full of impatience, I was stunned on the spot, what's going on here? Not only me, but Alicia, floating in the air, was also stunned, when the woman saw Simon, she sneered, oh, Simon, your son is here. She glanced at Diego and said, that stupid woman's child doesn't look very smart. Look at his chubby, silly face. If we lock him up and make eating videos, we could definitely make money. You wouldn't be reluctant, would you? Diego immediately pledged his loyalty. Of course not. If he's not a child we had together, I don't care. As long as you're happy, you can do whatever you want with him. I was speechless. I didn't expect Alicia's lover to have another lover, and he didn't care about this son at all. Did I unlock a hidden storyline? Ha ha ha. This is a plot even a simp couldn't imagine. I watched as Alicia screamed and pounced, slapping and tearing at the two. Ah, you pretentious coquette and cheating scum. I'll kill you. Alicia, can't you see what's going on? Don't interrupt a father and son reunion. Chapter 12. In the dark of night, I gripped the steering wheel with one hand, speeding down the road. Alicia floated in the passenger seat, staring at me for a long time. She lowered her head and suddenly said, Romeo, I'm sorry. I suddenly slammed on the brakes. The tires screeched against the pavement making a harsh sound that was particularly jarring in the silent night. Do you think a simple sorry is enough? My voice was extremely cold, devoid of any warmth. Her pupils trembled. It took her a long time to find her voice. You, you can see me. I curled my lips into a cold smile, not answering her question. Instead, I unfastened my seatbelt, took her urn from the back seat, opened the car door, and walked to the roadside sewer. Her crimson eyes flickered with fear. What? What are you doing? I looked down at the urn in my hand my gaze icy. I've dealt with the old and the young. Now it's your turn. What do you mean? You knew there was a problem with that chicken soup and deliberately let my mom drink it, didn't you? You cold-blooded murderer. It's not enough that you harmed me. You had to harm my mom too. I shrugged. Opened the lid of the urn. If you say so, then so be it. Anyway, this is our last meeting. No, don't. She screamed hysterically, her voice filled with fear and despair. Romeo, for the sake of our marriage, treat me like a fart and let me go. I ignored her flipped my hand, and poured all the ashes into the sewer. Ah, she let out a shrill scream, her voice gradually disappearing into the depths of the sewer. Scum like her deserves to stay forever in the dirty, smelly sewer. I casually threw the urn into a roadside trash can and returned to the car. Suddenly, the air around me felt much fresher. I played a cheerful song and restarted the engine, driving onto the road that belongs to me.